be here. We'll go back to Daniel 2 again this morning. And uh, we're going to look at it now in the dispensational aspect of this thing. And uh, it should help us understand a great deal about the Scripture as we look at it dispensationally. Father, I pray that you give me the gift of teaching this morning and open the hearts of the people. Help us understand and learn from your word. In thy name we pray, amen. Uh, we, a few days ago we started a series on the uh, great prophecies, the book of Daniel. If you remember last Sunday morning, I showed you a hybrid, which of course is a giant, a Nephilim. And this one they had, uh, the, our military has just recently encountered over there in Afghanistan. And of course you didn't hear anything about it in the news because it doesn't fit uh, Darwin's agenda for one thing. Darwin's very, Darwin doesn't like giants. A Darwinian uh, evolutionist does not like giants, it doesn't fit. And uh, especially one with six fingers, and six toes, some with double rows of teeth, and uh, the smell, the skin, the hair, and all that. They don't like that, and it doesn't, it doesn't match. But in any event, I uh, showed you that, and that, of course, has to do with Daniel 2.43, where it says they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And that is a peculiar statement. That's not a statement of, uh, that you would think that would uh, uh, simply refer to men with men. They, set in contradistinction to men, means that we've got something that's different from a man. And that, of course, is what's going on today. I, I, uh, I firmly believe that uh, we've gotten to the point now where they call it critical mass, where the vast majority of the people in the world are either, are either directly demon-possessed or they are at least demon-influenced. For the apostle said doctrines of demons or doctrines of devils. Now the dispensational aspect of this thing is very important because it will help us understand uh, the, the movement of the Holy Spirit of God down through history uh, we have an image in Daniel chapter number 2. It's got a head of gold, a chest of silver, midsection of brass, and then legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. If you'll notice, it degenerates in, uh, in preciousness uh, as it goes downward, and gold being by far the heaviest and most precious metal of everything involved here. And then second to that is silver, and then we get into brass and we get into iron. Uh, this represents these Gentile kingdoms are compared to that by the metal uh, that's in this image of Daniel. It starts in 606 B.C. Now, you'll get, when I give you a date, some will say 605, some will say 604. Uh, you may get different dates. I wouldn't, put a, I wouldn't worry about that. Don't worry about that uh, when you have a discrepancy of a, a year or two in dating. Uh, for example, I say 586 B.C. is when Nebuchadnezzar uh, the Babylonians took uh, Jerusalem, 722 B.C. The Assyrians took the Northern Empire. Uh, 1400 B.C. Moses wrote the, uh, the, uh, the Pentateuch. 1000 B.C. is the time of David. 1900 B.C. Abraham, so forth and so on. These are general dates that we, uh, that we use, and there's nobody out here that can prove anyway exactly which date, and scholars themselves disagree on the dating. So don't get caught up with, you know, uh, with, with dates. There are some dates that are, dates that are fixed, 1054 A.D. We know that, this, that the, the two, the two uh, parts of the Roman Empire were split. We know that. We know the dates of some important battles. Uh, the Battle of Actium, I think it was 31 B.C. when uh, Cleopatra and Mark Anthony fought Octavius and he won and, uh, and became the undisputed ruler of the, uh, of the Roman Empire. These are dates that, we, that, we, that are pretty well fixed, but don't get caught up in dates. You know, the best thing to do with somebody is to try to find a place where you can fellowship with somebody and get along with them instead of trying to argue with them because if all you want to do is argue, there'll be plenty to argue about. Believe me. So in Daniel chapter number 2, you have a head of gold, midsection of brass, and, uh, of silver, midsection of brass, and legs of iron. Uh, and let me give you some dates here to help us get a little bit of a chronology going. 606 B.C., the beginning. This is the 
head of gold, the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. It's when the Gentiles take possession of Jerusalem and take it away from the Jewish people. The Medes and the Persians eventually joined together in 539 B.C. in Daniel chapter number 5. That's the dating of the kingdom of the Medes and Persians when they took it away from the Babylonians. Alexander the Great is dated at about 331 B.C. And this is when Alexander took the kingdom away from the Medes and the Persians, especially essentially the Persians. Then in 168 B.C., we have the Romans who rise to prominence and power and, uh, and, and, and begin to rule over the Gentile kingdoms of the world. From 606 B.C., folks, until this present time, this is very important. It has been one Gentile kingdom right after another. The Jewish people have never reigned over this earth. There has never been a Jewish Messiah reigning on this earth. Never has been. It hasn't happened. An amillennial or a postmillennial brethren will try to tell you that the kingdoms are spiritual and that the reign is a spiritual reign through his people. I don't believe that. And I'm going to show you some scriptures this morning that I think will help you put that in perspective. I don't believe that. I believe the literal kingdoms of this world right now are Gentile kingdoms, but they're coming to a swift end. And that swift end will be brought by the Mashiach or the Messiah when he comes. A stone cut out of a mountain. He'll smite that image on its feet, and it'll come crumbling down. So the Gentile kingdoms are coming to an immediate catastrophic end. It won't be a slow, gradual decline. It'll be an immediate end, catastrophic. Boom. It's over with. And that takes place when Christ comes back in the tribulation period. Revelation 11 says the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. As I said to you a moment ago, the two legs on this image, the two legs, represent the division of the Roman Empire. The Gentile kingdoms were essentially divided because God calls your attention to this. In 1054 AD, the eastern branch and the western branch eventually had what's called the Great Schism. They were separated. What you have now is the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a schism here uh, and, all, and has existed since 1054. Uh, officially, it's existed long before that. When Constantine moved the headquarters of, the, of his empire, he was an emperor, when he moved the headquarters of his empire from Rome to a little town at the, at the crossroads of the world, uh, Byzantium, a little Greek town, he moved his empire there, the headquarters of it, and they changed the name of it to Constantinople after Constantine. He essentially turned his back on Rome and the authority of the Catholic Church and the Pope and all of that and began to exercise that authority for himself. He didn't outlaw them, but he was simply saying, I'm moving to the east and when I move to the east, this will become the headquarters of the Roman Empire. And it was. Now, the name of that city today is, is, uh, is uh, who could tell me? Exactly. It's in Turkey. Istanbul. So remember, it has three names. It has Byzantium, Constantinople, and Istanbul. Istanbul is in Turkey. Uh, Recep is, uh, Erdogan is the prime minister of Turkey. And for some strange reason that I can't figure out, and there's probably, I'm sure there's a reason for it, he's trying to pick a fight with Russia. He doesn't stand a chance. Russia would go through Turkey like a sieve. But the problem is that Turkey's a member of NATO. And the, one, of the, one of the treaties of NATO, or one of, the, one of the precepts of NATO, that if any country in NATO is attacked, it's as if they were all attacked. And so this NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization Alliance, was formed at the end of World War II to counter the Soviet aggression by Stalin. And so NATO was formed for that purpose. And, uh, of course, NATO is uh, uh, essentially an extension of the United States of America and its power and authority. You know that as well as I do. But the bottom line is that Turkey is a member of NATO. 
And so we've got a problem developing here. It's almost as if we've got some people up here in Washington that want a war with Russia. You don't want a war with Russia. They're beginning to, uh, they're beginning to show some of the weapons they've developed, and they have technology in areas the United States apparently doesn't have. And uh, it's no pushover, believe me. If the United States locks horns with Russia, it'll be the worst, it'll be the greatest war it's fought since World War II. No question about it. But on the other hand, the one-worlders, the people pushing for a one-world government have their agenda, and maybe that's what they see that is necessary to do that. But in any event, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey is Erdogan. So Constantine has moved his headquarters to the east. And to this very day, you see the result of it, the Orthodox Church. And the Orthodox Church is huge, folks. And it's not just one church. It's scattered everywhere. It's Greek, Armenian, uh, Russian. Uh, you have the Copts in North Egypt and North Africa. And you've got uh, other or Orthodox, all kinds of, well, I can't think of all, Syrian Orthodox over there right now in Syria. All kinds of Orthodox churches in the branches of the Orthodox Church. So the kingdom was, or the, this image with its legs was split in 1054 A.D. And when this took place, it caused what's called the Great Schism. And the Pope in Rome, right now the present Pope is uh, Francis. The Pope in Rome has held to the fact that he is absolutely the apostolic see, that his seat is the seat of Peter, that he is absolutely primary to all bishops on this earth, and the Roman Catholic Church is it and, it, and it has authority directly from God. And every other church must, ob, must observe obedience to the authority and the will of the Roman Catholic Pope. That's their position. And it hasn't changed one bit. If you really like to know the position of the Catholic Church, uh, what was it, 1546, the Council of Trent? Go back and read what the Council of Trent had to say. And this was, in, this was in reaction to the Protestant Reformation. The Council of Trent, uh, anathema, 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 anathema. In other words, cursed, 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 cursed. They pronounced more curses on the people on this earth that did not acknowledge the authority of the Catholic Church, the authority of the Pope, so forth and so on, and on and on and on it goes. Remember, Council of Trent. <coughs> and there's nothing's changed. So it brings us down to this present time. So what happens? Well, we're still in the kingdom. We're still in the times of the Gentiles. But 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus came here, he did not come to overthrow King Gentile dominion. He did not come to overthrow Gentile power and authority. I got an email from a man the other day. He said he went to a school here locally. And he said it wasn't long in that classroom before he began to realize that the teacher, the professor in this Bible college, was saying that the first goal of the Lord Jesus Christ was not realized, so he went to plan B. See? Yeah, he went to plan B. All right. Now we're going to deal with some of that stuff today. It's as if he reacts. The Lord Jesus did not react. God does not react. Ephesians says, known to God are all of his works. He doeth according to the counsel of his own will. But in any event, the, he sent this email, and that was the thesis of what he said caused. He said he stayed one semester, and he was gone and uh, because of that uh, position. And that's a local Baptist church. You see, eschatology will, will determine what you preach and what you believe. Now, you hear me up here preaching about CERN. You've heard me preach about CERN, Switzerland. You've heard me preach about hybrids. You've heard me preach about giants. You've heard me preach about fallen angels. You've heard me preach about all the... Do you realize, folks, how many Baptist churches in this town, you'll never hear that? <laughs> you'll never hear that. And uh, for various reasons. And the reason I mention it so much is because they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. I take that literally. I believe it has something to do with a supernatural intervention in the last days. Now let's go back 2,000 years ago to the time of Christ and to his ministry when he came. Turn to Luke chapter number 16, verse 16. Luke 16, 16. 
just remember, we're talking about the dispensational aspect of this image of Daniel chapter number 2. This image, Nebuchadnezzar's image. We've, we, are, we are moving progressively through divine revelation from the head that is gold to the feet that are brass, that are iron and clay. Now look carefully at Luke 16, verse 16. And let's read what it says. These are, these are stops. These are, these, are, these are statements about a period of time that something stops and something starts. This is why I'm a dispensationalist. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, now John who? Let's get John right here. Who's, who's John? Exactly, all right. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. Now watch carefully. And every man does what into it? <coughs> he forces himself by violence into it. That's what that means. By violent overthrow. Has that, been the, has that been your experience on earth? One war right after another, right? Exactly. One war right after another. All right. Now I want you to go to this passage and uh, in the chapter number 11 of Matthew in verse 12. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. Okay. Now remember, John the Baptist seems to be a bellwether. He seems to be a, a dividing line. John the Baptist seems to be where one, something stops and something starts. Look at Matthew chapter number 12, 11 and verse number 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. There we go again. There's that violence. And what is it this time? It's the kingdom of heaven. What's happening? The kingdom of heaven is vulnerable to violence. Remember, we're talking about the times of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, as they relate to a spiritual kingdom or to the kingdom of Christ, or to the ministry of the gospel, what's going on on this earth, the Lord Jesus said, they take it by force. Now let that settle in for a moment. Just let it settle in. Think on that for a minute. Now go back with me to Luke chapter number 22, verse number 35. And see if these scriptures together don't begin to make a little sense. Luke chapter number 22 and verse number 35. <clears throat> and he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, But now, but now, here we go now. Here is something that is changing. I'm preparing you. But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it. Likewise his script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must be yet accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me of an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. Now, I guarantee you, if you take a survey of the average Baptist church, just average Christian church, you take a survey of them and ask them, what should your reaction be if somebody smites you on the cheek? I guarantee you that 99 times out of 100, they'll say, turn the other cheek. Right. Won't they? These are good people. Yeah. These are good people. I'm not up here to run anybody down. I'm trying to show you the dispensational aspect of Daniel's image. There was a time when the kingdom of heaven was preached by the king to the people about to receive the kingdom from the king who was the only one qualified to reign over the kingdom of heaven was him. And that kingdom was about to be established and that he gave them the gospel of that kingdom because he's ruling in Jerusalem with a rod of iron he said, if he smites you on one cheek, turn the other. And that becomes like this good Samaritan. That becomes 
that becomes, uh, that becomes universal knowledge among people who wouldn't even go to a church house. The only time you'll see them comes when they roll them through the door in a casket. <laughs> they don't go to church. But they all know that you can take a little wine for your stomach's sake. They all know that the Good Samaritan, they know that term, and they know that if they smite you on one cheek, turn the other. Right? That becomes part of the culture. That becomes, that becomes, that becomes uh, uh, populist knowledge. Everybody knows it. Everybody understands it. It's part of the culture. Uh, and so do you not believe in turning the other cheek? If by the grace of God there's a reason for what's going on in a certain particular situation, it might be good to turn the other cheek because it might be an opportunity for you to witness to somebody by the grace of God in a certain situation to do that. But in a general rule, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the dispensational aspect of the New Testament and where we are now in relationship to the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. This is important, folks. This is a big deal. If you can follow what I'm trying to say to you, if somebody smites you on one cheek, maybe it's best in that situation to turn the other cheek. But if a man walks through that back door locked and loaded and he starts to shoot people, are you going to turn your cheek? No, they're going to drag him out the back door feet first. So wait a minute, preacher. Do you have any scripture for that? I just read it to you. But why did it change? That should be what you, could, you should concern yourself with. Why did it change? See, that's important. If you're not a dispensationalist, you are locked into, a, into, a, into, a, into some kind of a spiritual understanding or a representation of the Bible and you never get past square one. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying you don't love the Lord. That's not what I'm saying. But you're in a mess. And if you don't make a difference, a clear difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, you're in a bigger mess. And there are men, as I've told you before, that I have great respect for that say there is no difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. All right? Yes, there is. They are not the same. The kingdom of heaven is a physical, literal kingdom ruled over by a king right here on this earth. And the first one to ever rule over that was Adam because the Bible said in Hebrews 2, he crowned him with glory and honor. But the problem is that nobody since Adam has really been qualified to reign over the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God simultaneously until the Lord Jesus showed up. And when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, he was eminently qualified to reign over the kingdom of heaven. For he, Gabriel said to Mary, and the throne of his father David will be his forever. And he is eminently qualified to reign over the kingdom of God. For he is, spirit, he is absolutely sinless and perfect. And, and the fullness of the spirit dwelled in him. So he had every right to reign over both of them. Here's the key to it. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God were here simultaneously at one time. 2,000 years ago when Christ was here, they were both here, but not now. As far as that kingdom of heaven being offered to the Jewish people or here in a reality, it's not. This is why that the Gentile kingdoms, remember the dispensational aspect of this, the Gentile kingdoms are pressing, taking by violence the kingdom of heaven on this earth. And they're going to do it until somebody comes with a bigger gun. Remember one of the generals back in World War I or somewhere back in there said, which side's God on? He's on the side with the biggest guns. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> they bull they ever pull big guns out in World War II. That's when they started using machine guns. Maxim invented a machine gun. He thought, if I invent this thing where it slaughters people, to such a degree it does, surely men will detest war and will never go to war again. No, they slaughtered them by the tens of thousands. Their bodies piled up on top of each other like cordwood. And that's what happened when England fought Germany and then the United States finally came in. No, men are going to go to war. It's, uh, and they're, going, they're getting ready to go to war again, folks. Watch this bunch. Watch this crowd. Watch them. You know what? It'd make you appreciate war a little better if they took those bankers off of Wall Street and let them put them in the front lines. Put the bankers in the front lines. You know, the draft dodge, the draft card burners, crowd from 20 or 30 years ago, they're too old. No, put them in the, put them in the front lines. Get Bill Clinton and put him up there. 
They're so quick to send their boys off into war, get blown all to pieces. And come. And then they get, over, they get over there and get blown up and come back with their legs shot off and their arms shot off, and they won't even take care of them. That's a shame. If this country ought to take care of anybody, it ought to take care of its veterans. Amen. They probably, the men in black will probably drag me off for saying that. We've got to the point now in political correctness, you can't say anything. So, when we go back and look at this thing, it says John the Baptist was the end of something and the beginning of something. The law and the prophets were until John. That's the law. All right? The law and the prophets. But since that time, the kingdom of what is preached and every man presseth into it. Let's go back and look at Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John, but since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Now remember the email that the man sent me and said, well, in my Bible college they were telling me that plan A didn't work, so the Lord Jesus had to revert to plan B. Do you remember when it says in the New Testament about John the Baptist, this is Elijah, if you will receive him, which was for to come. It means that God Almighty can make it work any way he pleases. And it's not that he reacts to anything because it was all laid out in eternity past that when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, he would come, number one, as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And that's why he came. He came to die. But here's the problem. What are you going to do with the Jew? Where does the Jew fit in this? You remember Alfred Rosenberg? He said the Jew is an accursed subhuman race that needs to be wiped from the face of the earth and eradicated from public view. Rosenberg said the Jew is nothing but a pariah, a parasite, and that he, that he, that he needs to cease to exist. Who is he? Well, he did have Jewish blood. There's no doubt about that. He did. If you want to go back and trace Adolf Hitler's background, you'll find out he had Jewish blood too. But Rosenberg was a minister of spiritual propaganda. He was the counterpart of Goebbels. And he was the one who was preaching. The, he was the one who helped formulate the Nazi doctrine of their of uh, of Eckhart and the other and the and all of the spiritual input, the, he created the Nazi doctrine of positive Christianity. It came from Alfred Rosenberg. I talked about that this past Wednesday night. I think I did up in the other building. Positive Christianity, how they spun this thing to make it fit, to make it fit where they wanted to, and 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 of course they did, and they and the German people bought into it. As long as you call it Christian, a lot of people will buy into it. You know, that's sad, isn't it? As long as you call it Christian. So, the, uh, so where we are is uh, we are in a situation where the Lord says, sell your cloak, sell your purse, sell your script, and buy a sword. And the reason you want to buy that sword is because I send you out now. You're going out. Your ministry is no longer temporal to the Jewish people. Your ministry now is to the ends of the earth. And I'm going to send you out with that sword. Now, how many of those disciples died a martyr's death? St. Andrew was crucified like this. This is Andrew's cross. All you've got to do is go to Scotland, the birthplace of, of golf, and you'll see St. Andrew's cross. It's like this right here. St. Andrew's cross. He was crucified like that. The tradition says Peter was crucified upside down. Now, whether he was or not, tradition says that. We don't know. But, uh, but Peter was uh, traditionally, tradition says that Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. And so they've crucified him upside down. And on and on. The one that some of them were stoned to death, this and that happened to these disciples. All right, it's obvious then from this that apparently they didn't use the sword to defend themselves. See, that's the point. That's the point. They chose rather to die a martyr's death than to, than, to, uh, than to use the sword to defend themselves. The only one that we are unsure of of how he died is the Apostle John. And uh, he was exiled in the Isle of Patmos. I've been over there. And they gave a story about how that John was 
put in a church, a, 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 a place there near, uh, near where we were, and that they kept him overnight, and then they put him in a, in a, in a, in a, in a big container and boiled him in oil, and it didn't kill him. And John came out of that and went right on with his life, and they couldn't kill him, that he had a, he had a special divine hand of God on him. Now, it's his tradition. There's nothing in the Bible about this. You know, this, you get this stuff when you go around the world and talk to people. We don't know what happened to John. We know that he was on the Isle called Patmos. He was the last of the living apostles. We know that. And, uh, you know, we don't know how he died. We know he died, uh, but uh, we don't know how. So your position on this, I've, I mean, I've said enough about it already for you, you should understand that uh, the world you live in today is a dangerous world. Fourteen people were just shot to death out there in California by two uh, deranged Muslims. Is that a misstatement? No. no. They were murdered, shot to death, and uh, 14 people. And none of them were armed. None of them could defend themselves. Not a one of them. And right before that, you've got uh, how many people were shot to death uh, out there in Colorado? None of them were armed. They go into these places, they call them soft targets, where the people are not armed. They can't defend themselves. Somebody told me coming in today that Jean per Piro, Janine Piro, the judge on, uh, on the Fox, she said, get you a gun. <laughs> That's what she said. Get you a gun and uh, prepare yourself. So what happens with our president? He wants to take your guns away. Mass shootings under the last five presidents. Ronald Reagan, 1981, 89, 11 mass shootings. Incidents with eight or more deaths, five. George Herbert Walker Bush, 1989, 1993, 12 mass shootings, mass murders. Incidents with eight or more deaths, three. Bill Clinton, 93 to 2001, 23 mass murders. Incidents with eight or more deaths, four. George W. Bush, 2001, 2009, 20 mass murders. Incidents with eight or more deaths, five. Now, you ready for this? 2009 to 2015, 162 mass murders. Incidents with eight or more deaths, 18. Under Ronald Reagan, the average mass murders per month, one point. 375. George Bush, George, George Herbert Walker Bush, 2.5. Clinton, 2.875. George, uh, George Bush, 3.0. And Obama, 23 plus per year, or almost two per month. Average number of mass murders per month. They've risen to 162. That makes you wonder what's going on, doesn't it? They're going to come into the churches, folks. I'm just trying to tell you. They're going to come into the churches. And the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, just said, uh, she just stated that uh, if she hears any talk in this country where they incite people to, I forget the terminology she used, uh, to incite them to some manner of retaliation against Muslims, that they will prosecute them with the full power of the Department of Justice. You know, that's what's coming. That's what's coming. So what's coming is that they are assaulting the First Amendment, the right to freedom of speech. That's, that's what's coming. The president is supposed to give a speech to the nation tonight at 8 o'clock. Is that correct? He's supposed to give a speech tonight at 8 o'clock. And while this happens, Donald Trump continues to rocket up in the polls. This is not a support for Donald Trump. This is an observation. He's at 36% now. Every time something like this happens, he continues to skyrocket. Let me tell you why. The American people may not like everything about Donald Trump. 
but he speaks about things that they're concerned about and they think he's got the manhood and guts to do something about it and they're going to support him because they consider him their last opportunity of a voice in Washington, D.C. of somebody that's got the gall to stand up and do what he says he's going to do. That's why they support Donald Trump. That's why. It's not because he's a saint. At times he can got a filthy mouth, but he's not running for pastor of America. He's running for president. There's a vast difference, big difference. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that this may be the last opportunity this nation will ever have in this upcoming election to do something that may, make an, that may affect a real change in this country that needs to be made. For right now, we have a we have a we have a president and a, and a, and and his and his uh, staff that are definitely pro-Muslim. And if you don't know that, you're blind. And they're looking for an opportunity now to shut the people up. And that's what's happening. And that's where we stand. And the American people, I believe, are going to bide their time until it comes time to go to the polls. And I believe that they are alarmed and they're smart, they're not stupid, and they know that it is not going the way that it should be going. And when it comes voting day, you may be surprised at what happens when they go into those voting booths. This thing is not getting better, it's getting worse. 14 people shot to death. Instead of putting the attention on the 14 people and the murderers that killed them, Instead, they've completely flipped it now, and they're putting the attention on you. Yes, ma'am. Falwell's son. Yes, he did, Liberty University. Told them they needed to be armed. So obviously with that, if you go to Liberty University, it's not a gun-free zone. So what I mean? You can go and sit in class at Liberty University, and, and, uh, and you're armed. So uh, that's pragmatism. Your best thing to do is to turn the cheek. If you can, the best thing to do is turn the other cheek. Show the man that you've got enough of the grace of God about you to, uh, you know, to, 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 to show him that through love and mercy and compassion, if you possibly can, you try to win him to the Lord. But if he's going to kill you and he's going to kill your family and he's coming in you know, locked and loaded, then what do you do? You see what I'm saying, folks? Now, how many of you listen to all we're talking about here this morning about this dispensational aspect of the Scripture? I've tried my best to show you. It's as clear to me as, as day and night that where you live right now and what, you're, and what you are now, according to the Scripture, you live in the times of the Gentiles when the Gentiles are taking by violent force that which belongs to God and that nothing's going to change about that until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he personally takes that kingdom himself. But during the meanwhile, meanwhile, you need to live in this world and you need to look out for those that are precious and dear to you. Amen? Amen. Did you know that Simon Cowell, how many of you know who, that's, who that is? He's an Englishman and he lives in a 35 million pound uh, mansion in London, England. And at 2 o'clock in the morning the other day, a burglar introduced himself to his home, got in somehow or another. And according to what I've read, Mr. Cowell was very shaken by the incident, very shaken by it, which rightfully so. That's not being critical. That's observing. That's being observant. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you allowed to carry a weapon in London, England? So at two o'clock in the morning, when somebody comes into your home, and uh, if you if you you know if, if there's a confrontation that takes place, then your life is in jeopardy. Very well, could be, all right. And if you're not armed, if you have no weapon, what do you do? What do you do? You see what I mean? So what's happened to the people of England? They've been stripped of their right to protect themselves. That's what's happened. That's what's happened. In France, Paris, France, I don't think you can legally carry a weapon, can you? And when those Muslims went into that uh, theater over there and shot a, 
100 people to death. They didn't have to worry about anybody having a weapon to fire back against them, but they did. Did you know that it is illegal to murder people? You say, well, that's ludicrous, preach. Listen, do you think a man that's going to murder you is going to observe somebody's gun carry law? Do you think anybody's law that has anything to do with the transport, carry, possession of a weapon is going to affect a murderer one way or another? He knows already that he's, going, that he's going to pay a supreme price. If he murders you, he's going to get a gun. And no gun law is going to stop him from getting a gun. That's the problem. So what happens? You've got a Second Amendment to the Constitution. A republic is a, is a nation that is governed by law. And the Second Amendment to that Constitution says that you have a right to defend yourself, to arm yourself. You know why they put that in there? One of the reasons they put that in there is because of, 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 the, of, the, of the European powers. But they probably might have known a little more Bible than a lot of people do today. Don't give them credit for that. They might have. They might have known that the, that, 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 that the, that the Gentile kingdoms violently take that which belongs to God. And that's what he's talking about. All right. Well, I'll shut up and we'll come to a close. We've got two or three minutes left. Anybody have a question about what we've covered today? We covered some heavy-duty stuff. The dispensational aspect of Daniel chapter number 2. To me, that would be one of the most important things that I could possibly study about that prophecy. And believe me, folks, I didn't get any of that when I first got saved. Didn't get any of that. The only thing that people down there in that church where I was saved could ever talk about was if they smite you on one cheek, turn the other. They had no concept of anything like that whatsoever. But you have now. You have. It's been presented to you. Something you got to, you know, you know now. Yes, sir. Uh, I did a study on, on Matthew chapter 5. And uh, the Levitical law says, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And then God finds in the Old Testament. When it was referring to the slapping of the cheek, what I found is that whenever someone would violate someone's rights, So even at the time he said that, obviously, it's not the way most people interpret it. Right. And they understood that. Right. right. You know, we, we try to in other words, they, under our they understood that he wasn't teaching people to just be completely in a passive state and you can't do anything to defend yourself. And, you know, if a guy pluck his eye out, he pluck, the priest would pluck his eye out. Yeah, that's true. Eye for eye and tooth for tooth. And uh, that's what I found. And that would make more sense. Because it, it would fit in with that part about defense. So there's no, there's no jails in, in, the, in the Bible. Yeah. You, you inflict punishment according to what you did to that person, whether it's. Well, you have to. You've got the kinsman redeemer. You've got to consider that. Right. The kinsman redeemer. He's the avenger of blood. Would, uh, it would eliminate a lot of lawyers and judicial system, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. We'll start up here in a minute and, uh, and uh, finish and have the later service. Brother Hopkins, will you dismiss us, please?